Okay, um, welcome to this presentation, advanced uh, SIM card topics. Um, some of them are listed in the uh, headline. Um, uh, the uh, sort of uh, topics that uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, administrative commands uh, for SIM cards, uh, the iSIM application, uh, the 5G related um, dedicated file, uh, this RRM applet and its use in uh, Android carrier privileges, uh, then a bit about global platform and uh, some updates on PySIM shell. Um, the chapter about OTA was not finished in time, uh, I have to admit. Uh, we can start to talk a bit about OTA, but uh, I will not be able to cover the full, uh, like the full uh, breadth of the uh, over the air uh, topic in this talk, unfortunately. Um, Nevertheless, I think it's going to be a lot of material anyway. So, yeah. Um, if you have questions, I'm uh, also looking at the chat. So if you uh, want to um, comment or raise your hand, uh, hopefully I will uh, notice that. Um, uh, and um, yeah, just just let me know if there's any questions or concerns or something is wrong. Uh, that, of course, can also be the case. So some very... Uh, a basic recap um, uh, before we go into the uh, detailed topics, um, some of the acronyms, some of the concepts. So um, smart large part about the SIM cards and related uh, subscriber cards in 3GBP networks is about the file system of cards. Um, and um, we have the MF, the master file, which is the root directory. We have DFs, so-called dedicated files, which uh, normal people would call subdirectories or folders. Um, then we have ADFs, application dedicated files, which is basically the root directory of an application. So in multi-application smart cards, there can be multiple applications and each of these applications can have an application dedicated file, which then can contain uh, more DFs, EFs, and so on. And which brings us to the EFs, the uh, entry file or elementary file. I've seen several uh, um, definitions for that acronym. Uh, which comes in multiple flavors. What most people are familiar with is the transparent uh, EF and the linear fixed EF. So the transparent EF is unstructured and just contains bytes, basically like a file on a uh, Unix file system, uh, which is just a stream of bytes. There's no structure to it. And there's also the concept of linear fixed files, uh, which is a file consisting of fixed length records. So also the notion of cyclic files and now also BRTLV files, uh, which is something we will cover in more detail uh, later in this uh, presentation. Um, so if we look at SIM cards, um, there are some bits uh, that are specified uh, by various uh, standardization organizations uh, that should be ISO, not ISO there in the top line. So ISO, Etsy, 3GPP specs mainly uh, specify most parts of, uh, in the, within those specification bodies, most of the specs uh, are uh, uh, released. There's also a global platform related to Java cards, which we will talk about uh, a bit later. Um, but there are, but what's, what's important to know is that those parts that are specified are really only those uh, that are relevant after the card has been issued, which means once the card is placed in the phone and whatever you need from that point in the life cycle of a SIM card onwards, that's the part that is specified because that's the part that needs to be interoperable. I mean, how does the phone read or write to the card? Uh, how do you perform over the air updates? How does authentication work? All of this is relevant. But whatever happens before that point in time in terms of the actual um, uh, personalization and provisioning of cards uh, is uh, beyond uh, the specification. Um, and even, for example, how the secret key material for the authentication of uh, the 3GPP network, um, how this material is stored uh, or, or how it is uh, inserted into the card, all of this is not specified uh, for SIM cards because it's not something that normally happens uh, after the card has been deployed. At least it's not how it's foreseen by the standards bodies. Um, if you're interested in this sort of uh, smart card provisioning production uh, personalization process, there was a talk in the Osmo Dev Call series some months ago. You can check it out on our website and, and uh, watch the video in case you're interested in that topic. So um, 
all of the stuff that we are talking to about today is uh, part of the specified, standardized um, part of uh, the SIM card universe. But uh, things that go beyond the normal uh, read file, read binary, uh, update binary, update file, authenticate and verify pin uh, commands that are like the most basic operation that happens all the time. So one of these topics is the topic of the so-called administrative commands uh, from HCTS 102.222, um, which uh, are uh, different from the normal commands uh, in that they are meant for the operator and card issuer. The normal commands uh, that we see, uh, like selecting a file, reading a file, updating a file, uh, verifying a PIN, authentication, and so on, these are all things that the normal user or, let's say, the phone of the user or the modem of the user performs uh, towards the smart card. Um, and then there are additional administrative commands which are intended for use by the operator or the card issuer, how it is called sometimes in the specs. Um, those administrative commands uh, typically only work after you have authenticated yourself uh, against the card in some special way so that the card knows you are basically the card issuer uh, and you are privileged to perform these kind of commands. So what kind of commands do we have? Um, in these uh, administrative commands, the first and foremost there is, of course, create file. And um, create file uh, is sort of uh, also how in many smart card operating systems, at least uh, files are created when you, um, uh, when you create a smart card profile. So you create the MF, you create all the DFs, you create the EFs, you create the ADFs, and so on, all of those files. Um, but uh, at least in some cards, depending on the operating system support and depending on how the card is, uh, the part, card profile looks like, uh, it is possible uh, to also create files at a later point in the life cycle, meaning that, for example, whenever 3GPP uh, updates the specifications and introduces new files, such as the files for 5G uh, that we are um, also going to talk about uh, in a couple of slides, um, that uh, once such new files are specified, uh, an operator could remotely uh, create such new um, car, uh, such new files on the card, uh, even over the air uh, uh, while the card is out there in the field, and thereby sort of adding a new functionality to the card that hasn't been there initially. Um, there's a question about the terminate and delete, and I will uh, get to that uh, quickly. Uh, let's go through the list. I mean, delete file is obvious. We delete it. There's nothing left uh, after delete uh, of the file. We could, we could recreate it afterwards. Uh, then we have the, the two deactivate and activate file commands. Uh, those are for temporary deactivation, meaning the, the file content uh, is retained. Um, you just cannot select the file anymore once it's deactivated, and then later on the operator could again activate the file um, and uh, thereby make it usable again. So that's basically just a, a temporary or possibly temporary uh, thing. Then um, the termination are a permanent uh, termination. That means after you have terminated the DF, it can never be used again. Um, and uh, that also means it, uh, it is still exists, but it's terminated uh, in, in a certain life cycle state. Um, and you cannot recreate it, for example, because there's still a terminated file with the same name. Uh, whereas if you would delete it, then uh, you could recreate a file with the same name because there's no file left at that point. Um, once again, keep in mind all of these commands, like the support of all these commands is entirely optional, so it's highly dependent on your card operating system whether those commands are supported or not. In the Sysmo ISIM SJA2, uh, all of those commands are supported, um, but not in all the profiles that we ship. Uh, they are permitted um, in all the different uh, directories or applications, but the operating system is capable of those. Last but not least, there is terminate card usage, which permanently bricks the card. So uh, don't do that unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> Otherwise, you have produced a piece of uh, electronic waste that you can dispose afterwards. Um, yeah, and as Prom points out, this is meant for life cycles uh, management, which is something that comes from the like smart card industry. Everything is about life cycles, life cycle of the card, life cycle of applications, life cycle of files. And um, once something is terminated, it is, uh, you cannot use it anymore in, in any way. 
Um, yeah, so these administrative commands, uh, I'll, we, we get to PySim and I'll, I'll show a bit, but uh, that's something also that was added to PySim shell uh, a couple of months ago. So we have full support for those commands, so we can now uh, deactivate, activate, create, delete files, uh, depending on the permissions, of course, uh, of course that the card um, uh, allows us to do as, as the operator. Okay. Um, Sort of next topic uh, in the list of topics uh, I'd like to talk about is the iSIM application. Um, so if we look a bit at the history, uh, we have the initial 2G SIM cards, uh, the first specified within, well, first CEPT and then Etsy, uh, had two uh, directories, two dedicated files, uh, DFGSM and DF Telecom where GSM contained uh, the GSM specific parameters uh, like the IMSI, for example, and DF Telecom contained the uh, more general telecom related parts such as the phone book of the subscriber um, uh, in those days where it was relevant to store this on, on the SIM card. Um, later on, before 3G networks were specified, Etsy specified the UICC, the Universal Integrated Chip Card, I guess it is, um, which is specified as an application independent card um, and the UICC has since been used in many different applications. One of them or the primary one probably was the USIM, the UMTS uh, SIM application, um, which uh, was specified in the context of the uh, 3G network, uh, UMTS network specification. When 4G came around, LTE, uh, they reused the same USIM uh, so there was no new application specified for, for the use with 4G networks. Um, uh, they just added a couple of optional new files uh, in, in the USIM uh, related to evolved packet uh, core uh, usage. And um, then uh, there was, uh, when, when IMS, uh, specifically in the context of Volte and uh, voice over Wi-Fi was specified, an iSIM application has been specified. So. For IMS, there's an optional additional application that can be present on the UICC in parallel to the USIM application and in parallel to other applications uh, and also in parallel to the old GSM and uh, so on uh, functionalities on the card. Um, this is entirely optional. Um, you can use, and I would expect, I mean, I, could, I don't really have that overview worldwide in the industry, but my feeling is that 90% or more networks that have IMS don't use uh, iSIMs. So uh, it's actually the more standard case is that there's no iSIM on the, uh, on, on, on the SIM card, no iSIM application, but still IMS networks are used. So uh, there is no need uh, for it uh, uh, because there's some fallback mechanisms uh, specified how the relevant identities and addresses uh, can be derived from the IMSI and from other properties which old USIM cards without an ISIM application uh, contain. Um, it's just that like, if you want to deviate from those fallback and auto-generated identities, uh, then you would need an ISIM uh, to specify that, or if you need some additional configuration that is not uh, compatible with the uh, fallback mechanisms, then you need the ISIM application to specify that. Um, there is a couple of, there are a couple of files which can be present either in the USIM application or in the ISIM application. That's uh, quite strange. I don't know um, why exactly uh, they did it that way, if it's just a historical artifact or if it's uh, if there were so many users uh, who wanted to stay with the USIM but still have some uh, IMS related bits configured uh, without having an ISIM application deployed, I don't know. But there's a couple of files, they're listed here, those five files, they can exist either in the USIM or in the ISIM. And if you have an ISIM on the card, they must not exist in the USIM. The specifications are rather clear on that. So I'm just mentioning this so uh, people don't uh, make that kind of mistake. So either you have an iSIM application and then those files may exist in the iSIM, um, but not in the USIM, or you don't have an iSIM application and then they may exist in the USIM. Um, another topic related to iSIM application is uh, the uh, authentication context or security context. Um, so um, while the authentication mechanism, uh, the UMTS aka, is exactly the same for ISIM and USIM, 
um, the context of both can be different. Um, and that, what do I mean by that? Um, basically, the transport and access layer network uh, authenticates against the USIM application on the card. Uh, while if there is an ISIM on the card, then the IMS level authentication with the PCSCF, for example, uh, is done against the ISIM application on the card. Um, so at least in theory, and you can do that also with the Sysmo ISIM cards, you can actually have even different key material and different algorithms configured for those two uh, cases. Uh, there's no requirement that uh, the key material and everything needs to be identical. It could be completely separate. Um, it's just if you don't have an ISIM, then of course uh, there's the fallback and the USIM uh, uh, key material and so on is, is used um, and uh, you don't have this choice anymore to have different uh, algorithms or different key material for those two planes um, uh, that are layered on top of each other. One interesting question is in this context, and I haven't really uh, experimented uh, that with that yet, if you do voice over Wi-Fi, um, what kind of key material is used for the EPDG IPsec for the outer IPsec uh, um, uh, tunnel? Um, uh, I guess it's going to be the USIM one, but I'm not 100% uh, uh, sure on that. And then inside that, uh, you have the PCSCF uh, with um, the ISIM application. Um, yeah, this is just a, a, a diagram from the spec about the files that exist in the ISIM um, uh, in, in, in a tree representation. Um, I'm going to go through them uh, quickly. Uh, so we have the MP that may contain uh, IMS private user identities. Uh, we have the impu which may contain public user identities. Those are identities used in IMS uh, registration. A domain name likewise also um, uh, relevant for IMS registration. Um, EFAD, actually, I don't know what exactly it contains in the ISIM, in the USIM, I would know it. Access rule reference is as usual, is, uh, it defines the, um, basically the, well, the permissions and, and access control lists for the files. Uh, the ISIM service table is like the USIM service table in the USIM, so it's a, a, a long bit mask of bits defining which optional uh, features this uh, card implements or doesn't implement. Um, and then we have yeah, the PCSCF uh, address um, and uh, generic bootstrapping architecture parameters. The NAF key center address, does anyone know what that is about? Um, I didn't know until today um, when, I, when I read uh, this uh, in, in the context of this presentation. It's XCAP, is it? Um, not that I'm, uh, the, what, what I, uh, uh, my understanding, and it was just very quickly reading is, this is really about a optional new mechanism that I never saw how the communication between the SIM and the phone could be encrypted. So that SIM trace, for example, wouldn't show you anything anymore. Um, but yeah, uh, there is a, a spec about that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that was my, uh, as I said, I haven't really seen this in practice and I haven't uh, investigated it further. Um, yeah, so uh, then we have SMS related files optionally. I don't think many will put them there in the IMS application because most uh, cards will have a legacy um, use them anyway. And then uh, you have those files there. A um, couple of other configurations, yeah, XCAP config data that uh, is basically supplementary services for IMS, IMS configuration, and even in WebRTC uh, URI that you can put there, I don't know how this is used, and some uh, multiple user identity, um, yeah, I, I also don't know what about this, this is really 16 stuff, I don't know exactly what this is for, this uh, mid config data, if anyone knows, um, I would be happy to uh, be enlightened about that. Ah, it's for Apple Watches. Okay, well, um, something I know, another topic I know nothing about. Um, ah, okay. Um, good. So the, for the recording, the comment was it's uh, the MATMIT is for Apple Watches, etc., and it's uh, about getting calls on the second device. 
Yeah, these new files, uh, particularly the last ones here in the list, uh, they bring us to a topic uh, that I already briefly mentioned that's called uh, the, the BRTLV or BRTLV files, which is a new type, a new structure of files on the cards, which is different from the traditional transparent linear fixed or cyclic files. Um, how is it different? Well, uh, it stores data in BRTLV format, a uh, format, and what a surprise, it's called that way. So basic encoding rules in tag, tag length value, basic encoding rules uh, data. The, everyone working in smart cards will have seen this before. But why a, a different file type? I mean, you can just put uh, the TLV, BR encoded TLV objects in a normal transparent file or even in a linear fixed file. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. And in fact, I think even some files do that for decades. Well, the difference is that in a BR in a, in a file uh, that is of B, BR TLV structure, you can uh, selectively read, write, update uh, basically the object for a single tag um, as a as a uh, APDU level operation. So you can say, I want to get the tag uh, zero x seven four, um, and uh, or rather, I want the, the 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 object represented by that tag, and then. The smart card itself will basically look for this tag in the TLV encoded uh, file and will only return this specific tag. Uh, one of the advantages compared to putting this in a transparent file is that you don't need to bother with padding because the on-card file system is aware of the TLV structure and knows how long the record, the TLV object is. So you don't need to do all this FF padding or strip the FF padding uh, uh, like it was with transparent files when storing such data in them. Um, these files are, uh, for those who are using the Sysmo ISIM cards, are uh, supported from Sysmo ISIM SJA2 version 2 onwards. Uh, we don't really publicly mention version 2 anywhere. Uh, it means uh, the IMSI ends in uh, something that's bigger than 50,000 at the end. Um, so uh, that is uh, when we introduce this support. Um, there's a number of uh, BRTLV files uh, in later 3GBP specs that uh, may exist. I mean, they're all not mandatory, of course. It's a lot of stuff that I think nobody uses, like these uh, graphics files or multimedia messages uh, I'd never heard uh, before, well, outside of the specs that anyone stores MMS messages on, on SIM cards. Um, Mission critical services that may be in, in those uh, mission critical um, uh, public uh, emergency uh, services and so on, I don't know, uh, may very well be deployed. V2X is a vehicle uh, to uh, something, so um, automotive use of uh, 4G, 5G configuration. And then uh, we have the IMS and the MATMIT config data, which are the RTLV files. Um, I was really surprised to see that they add like rather new, I think it was what release 14 or something. I, I wouldn't put my, uh, I wouldn't bet on that, but it was rather late in the standardization process that uh, rather recent uh, that they introduced these BR TLV files. I was rather surprised because I cannot really think of any other reason other than um, uh, the smart card uh, vendors want to sell more new smart cards or new operating systems uh, for which they can charge more uh, compared to the older ones. So, uh, of course, if you have a, a smart card in the field for 10 years um, and it's produced long before these BER TLV structure files are, no over the air mechanism is going to help you uh, add uh, this new file type uh, to your operating system. So, you actually need. Uh, in, in most situations, you need a new card in, at this point if you want to use one of those files. So yeah, um, a bit strange, but well, many things I think are strange in terms of uh, SIM card specs. Okay, good. So um, yes, BRTLV as such uh, from notes that it has been around in ISO 7816 for quite some time. Um, uh, are you referring specifically to BRTLV structured files or just to the BRTLV? Of course, in the SIM cards everywhere you have BRTLV, like your, your file control parameters are BRTLV encoded and many of the even transparent files are specified to do that. But having, having this file type with the structure of BRTLV that uh, in, in 3GPP context is rather recent uh, using that, introducing that. Um, 
Okay, good. Um, then I uh, probably uh, forgot about it or um, uh, the ISO 7816, I remember reading 20 years ago, so I was too old to have this uh, in there. So um, the uh, 5G uh, dedicated file is the next topic. Um, so for 5G, unlike for IMS, uh, 3GB did not specify a new card application, so there's no 5G ADF, no application dedicated file, no related application. Uh, the same USIM is used uh, as uh, for 4G and uh, previously for 3G. Uh, there's some new optional additional files uh, in a new dedicated file uh, underneath ADF USIM. So we have ADF USIM and below that we have DF5GS. And then we have uh, various files. And of course, all of those files have new services in the use and service table that indicate whether or not those files are present. Um, yeah, so uh, we have uh, the switch GPP Loki file that is like EF Loki and EPS Loki. Um, so it contains the location area, location information, um, which is the service area code, tracking area code, whatever uh, of the last cell uh, when when the um, UE shuts down so that uh, when it reboots, it can uh, restart uh, scanning for exactly this uh, cell, assuming that it was not moved in, in, geography, in geography between switching off and switching on. Uh, we have the NAS security context authentication keys. Um, again, the 5G auth keys file is like EF.keys in uh, 3G or even the same EF keys uh, uh, for 2G before. So the current session keys uh, that are, are stored on the SIM card so that um, after reboot of the phone or um, even uh, switching it off for some time, switching it on later, we still have the keys that were last generated during authentication um, uh, mechanism. Um, the Suchi computation in the mobile equipment, we will get to that uh, in a separate slide. Uh, operator list, of course, we have operator lists for, for all the other technologies. So now we can have an operator list for 5G. Um, we can have uh, uh, SUPI as network access identifier in cases where there is no IMSI. So in 5G networks, there's no longer a requirement to have an IMSI as a unique identifier, I mean, but other identifiers and uh, those other form of identifier can be stored in this EF SUPI NI. Um, yeah, some other additional uh, configuration options there in other files. Um, this is again the, the, the three rep the, the three representation of that. <laughs> Sorry for this uh, thumbnails in there that uh, was unintentional when taking the screenshot. Um, uh, so uh, just a few files, uh, very few compared to all the you know hundreds of of existing files for older technologies. Um, and one topic that relates to SIM cards in 5G is the topic of uh, calculating the SUCHI. So the SUCHI is the subscriber concealed identifier, unlike the SUPI, the subscriber permanent identifier. And um, the uh, SUCHI is a, um, um, uh, well, a concealed version of this permanent identifier. So the SUPI, in legacy cases, it's the IMSI is a, is an, a unique identifier for the subscriber. And of course, for privacy reasons, uh, this is always uh, bad if you have a unique identifier being transmitted over the uh, radio network in terms of tracking people and uh, location privacy and so on. And uh, if the SUCHI mechanism is being used, then uh, the uh, IMSI or the SUPI is not transmitted in clear text anymore over the radio interface. Um, and the question now is how is this uh, concealment uh, oper computation or operation, uh, where is it happening? And there's two scenarios or two options. One is that the SUCHI is computed on the phone, on the mobile equipment, um, using key material that it has obtained from the SIM card by reading it from the SIM. Or the other option, the more secure one, of course, is the SUCHI computation on the SIM card itself meaning that there's uh, like in the, uh, let's say in the uh, UMTS AKA, uh, for example, there's uh, 
secret key material stored on the SIM card and it's not uh, visible to the file system, it's not readable uh, to an outside entity of the card. Um, but the SIM card uh, computes uh, the, the basically using the the, the SUPI and, and this key material, it computes the concealed identifier and passes it to the mobile equipment, to the phone um, to use over the network. Um, in terms of like normal SIM cards that I can buy from operators and also uh, in terms of uh, SIM card OSs that I'm aware of, the vast majority doesn't support the computation on SIM card. I've only seen it in the EU ICC universe uh, in terms of eSIM profiles, but not in, in uh, like classic SIM cards. Uh, haven't seen it uh, there yet, but uh, of course it will, it will happen eventually, I'm quite sure. It's just a matter of uh, until everybody updates to later um, card OS versions and so on. And now um, in terms of the uh, card uh, in, in, the, um, in the USIM service table, um, which we don't see here since it's the USIM service table and there's no 5G specific service table, you configure whether uh, which of those two, well, if the SUGI is used at all and if then which of those two methods are being used. Um, and uh, if it's the uh, computation on the phone, then you have the Suchi Calc info file, which uh, basically contains the relevant information so that the UE can perform the calculation. Okay, um, that's it for the 5G um, card related, uh, SIM card related topics. Um, any questions on that particular topic before we move to the next? Didn't see any so far. Okay. Yeah, so Merlin has just shared a tutorial for writing the Suchi Calc info um, to the card. Uh, that's appreciated. Um, could, of course, also merge that in the PySIM shell user manual if you did it with PySIM shell. Um, if you wanted to integrate it there, of course, I think many people would, I would, I would expect it's more likely that people would find it there um, in, in the context of PySIM at least, which is not the only way of doing things. Um, okay, um, then let's get to the RRM the, uh, and, and Android carrier privileges. Um, so as the name implies, this is an Android specific topic. Uh, it doesn't have any implications on non-Android devices, but uh, on Android, it's possible uh, using the system to give certain applications uh, more access to more APIs on, on the Android operating system. So we're not talking about card applications here, but about Android apps. And um, uh, the amount of APIs an Android app gets access to can be increased by this uh, mechanism. Um, and what kind of APIs are we talking about? Uh, it's about the carrier operator related settings like APN, roaming lists, uh, IMS configuration parameters, also some other things which I find more um, Curious, like you can inject SMSs into Android from an app, uh, basically SMSs that were not received over the radio, uh, but like not over the normal like uh, um, signaling, but uh, some app that you run on the phone receives an SMS over some IP mechanism uh, and then can inject it into Android as if it was received from, uh, from, from the radio network. I'm not sure, uh, probably people do this to avoid, uh, like maybe MBNOs uh, do this to avoid uh, SMS charges, I, I have no idea. Um, but it's one of the more uh, strange things that you can do once an app has these uh, carrier privileges. Now, how do you get uh, into that um, like elevated privilege level? Um, there is a hash or certificate of the key used, like all the all the, the Android apps are signed with a key anyway. And if you put a hash of the signature key on the SIM in a specific way, then Android uh, uh, matches this and detects it and the API access is granted to such uh, applications. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy as putting this in a file in the file system, um, but they had to do uh, something convoluted uh, called secure element access control for this. Um, so uh, this is a slide from the specifications of this, the global platform 
secure access control, secure element access control uh, specification, yes. Um, so we have basically the device, which is the phone in this context. Uh, then we have the access control enforcer, which is whatever part of the Android operating system that enforces access to those APIs. We have the application which, with, with signature certificate. And um, then uh, we have a communication to the SIM card. Uh, and the secure element is the SIM card in this context. And one part uh, in the uh, issuer security domain of uh, the card is the so-called RRM applet. Um, and now the access control enforcer talks to the RIM applet and gets these uh, um, these hashes of, of the certificate basically, and um, it can then detect whether an application should receive this elevated privilege level for the API or not. Um, this is fully publicly documented. Like the 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 RIM applet and this access control mechanism is a global platform spec, and then the Android specific bits of this are documented uh, in the AOSP project from and from Android. So uh, that's all public. There's nothing um, secret about it. So how can you play with this in practice? Um, well, either you have a SIM card uh, that has uh, this RIM uh, built in or pre-installed in some form from the SIM card vendor. Or if your card doesn't do that, but it is a Java card, uh, then uh, there is an open source minimal implementation of an RRM applet uh, from Bertrand Martel. Um, and uh, yeah, you can you can download that. It's Java source code. You can compile it and you can uh, flash it, uh, install it on your on your Java card using Global Platform, by the way, which we will get to uh, later in this talk. Uh, we installed this already on the Sysmo ISM SJA2 card. So if you have one of these, uh, the exact uh, open source RIM applet here is, is already pre-installed on the cards. Um, and in uh, recent months also, we have uh, PySim shell support for this. So uh, we can uh, com more comfortably uh, install and delete uh, uh, rules there. Um, so Preeth Harley has, has written uh, um, a lot of information about this topic in his uh, CUIMS wiki, um, so you can uh, read more about this uh, mechanism there. Um, yeah. So um, in terms of uh, PySIM shell updates, uh, compared to uh, almost a year ago, 10 months ago by now, when the last talk or the first and last talk about PySIM shell happened here in the Osmo dev call. Uh, we have, of course, lots of bug fixes, uh, a number of new commands, new encoders, decoders, and so on. Um, in terms of the commands, the TS-102-222 administrative commands are supported, as I mentioned before. Uh, there is a new USM UST service check command. It's basically, uh, I always think of it sort of an FSCK, a file system check for the SIM card. It, it tests for consistency whether the services enabled in the service table uh, correspond to uh, the files that are available and selectable on the card, because there's usually uh, some relationship, unfortunately not always one-to-one, -one, but sometimes end-to-m relationships, whether this service is enabled and uh, this and that and this other file uh, should exist or vice versa. Um, this can be tested. Uh, I, I can demo uh, this quickly um, after uh, we go through the slides. We have the APDU command, which allows you to enter or to execute arbitrary uh, APDUs as hex string from PySim shell. Uh, well, of course, you can do that with uh, uh, PyScript or, or with Cyberflex shell or any other tool. Um, but the advantages uh, from doing this uh, inside PySim shell is that you can use all the other commands uh, for, for navigation in the file system, for example, the high-level commands, and uh, verifying the ADM pin, which you've already stored in your CSV file, so you don't need to manually enter it, and uh, all these this comfortable uh, bits. Um, and then you can enter a raw APDU uh, just to do something that is not possible uh, with PySim shell yet at uh, the given location. Uh, the export, um, which exports all the files uh, uh, of uh, the card, um, has a dash dash JSON option, so it doesn't only export in the binary hex dump, but also in the decoded JSON format. Um, that's of course not. Um, that's more for 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 reading uh, the export uh, for human interpretation or maybe programmatic uh, access to the card content in decoded form. But uh, the normal classic export is 
for backup and restore of SIM cards. And there, of course, it's good to store the raw uh, hex data um, because then you know for sure uh, that it will be restored exactly the same way. And you don't have any encoders and decoders in there. Yeah, TLV definition, de definitions, encoders, decoders. Uh, BRTLV file support, RIM applet support, um, and in general support for non sysmocom cards um, uh, was added and improved. Um, so of course not as tested, but uh, yeah. I'm working right now on uh, some basic global platform stuff, um, which we will get to in a second, but uh, I think uh, I quickly show um, what can be done with PySim shell these days. So well, let's increase the font size a bit probably even. Um, yeah. Um, does that work, or is it uh, too small for the screen share? Works fine on 2K. Works well. Okay, good. So yeah, um, uh, we started Python shell. We're in the master file. Um, we see already uh, the USIM ISIM application is present. We also see there's an issue security domain, and we see the RIM applet with its application ID is uh, found. So um, uh, let's uh, look at the uh, some of the things. The USD service check, for example. So uh, I can go. Uh, by the way. Uh, traditionally, you always had to select every element of the path. Now we can also select aggregate paths. So I can do something like that, if uh, UST, um, and now I can do the U. No, the US. Not, I'm not suspend <laughs> the UST service check, um, which goes through all the services. And you see on this card, there's a lot of things that shouldn't, uh, that are not correct as they should. So let's start from top. So basically, we iterate over all the services in the USIM service table, and we see, well, service number two is active. And if uh, this number service is active, the spec says this file EFFDN URI should be selectable. Uh, no, it, ra rather, uh, it should not be selectable, but it is. Um, so we find that this file can be selected despite the spec saying if service number two is active, this file shouldn't be selectable. Um, and basically all these consistencies are checked um, and you can then um, use, for example, the administrative commands uh, to uh, deactivate the file to fulfill the condition. And we can actually do that as an example now. I mean, just look through the list. There's, there's more stuff that is not how it should be. Um, also the inverse here, we have uh, services active, but the related files are not selectable, even though they should be. Um, and um, yeah, basically it tells you 55 service file inconsistencies detected in this card, and you can now go on fixing those up. So um, if we have service two, um, let's just see what this is all about, the service two. Service two is, uh, this is too long, uh, is fixed dialing numbers apparently, yeah. And the complaint was that FDN URI is selectable, but it should not be selectable. Um, okay, so we can select the ef.fdn URI. It is selectable. We can confirm that. Um, but apparently, it should not be selectable. Um, so if it should not be selectable, we can deactivate it. I can verify the ADM pin, which I've stored in uh, the CSV file, so I don't need to remember it. Uh, the CSV file uh, looks it up based on the ICC ID. Um, and it displays it because that's the best security practice ever to display the administrator pin um, on the screen. Um, and now we can, for example, uh, deactivate the file. Um, and if we now again select the USIM service table and uh, we again uh, perform the USD service check, then hopefully um, there will not be an error about service number two anymore. Indeed, it just says checking service number two active, okay, but no error message. And indeed, we now only have 53 inconsistencies rather than 55 uh, that we had before. So we've seen the administrative command. And if I wanted, if I would select now the FDN URI again, I get, uh, of course, selected file invalidated. This file can no longer be selected. So I see that the deactivate has actually happened. And if I want to activate the file again, I can uh, say activate file, of course, uh, from the DF in which the um, 
uh, from the ADF USIM basically. Uh, I cannot select the file, at, right? I need to activate it first. And now if I select it again, I can again um, select the file. So we have seen administrative commands. We've seen the UST service check um, commands that we have. Uh, the APDU command, well, uh, yeah, uh, don't really have a nice uh, APDU now that we could do. Um, uh, well, we could uh, whatever um, zero zero a four zero 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 four zero two three f zero zero that selects the master file for those who cannot read APDU X code in their head. So we have selected 3F00, which is the master file. And that's exactly the kind of thing you shouldn't do with the APDU command, because as the command description says, dangerous files in shell will not know any card state changes and not continue to work as expected, for example, if you select a different file. right? Because now we have the card has changed uh, um, the, the, uh, the selected file, but uh, the PySim shell still thinks uh, we are in this file and uh, thereby we have inconsistency. So that's not what it is meant to do, but I didn't really have any other idea about what APDU to use it right now in this uh, demonstration. So um, let's just do a select MF here and uh, bring those two states in sync again. Um, we have the export as just JSON. So maybe very quickly, uh, let's do an export um, in the old fashioned way um, and, and abort it quickly. So we see it selects certain files like this EFADN and DF Telecom. What's new is that we also get the raw uh, in a comment, the raw FCP template and the decoded FCP template, which tells us uh, with file size and, and all kinds of things. Um, and but the individual records are all displayed or saved in hex. Uh, the point of this is that you can use this generated export to to uh, uh, restore the card content because the, these file, these commands here can be basically used as a script or a standard into Python shell. Um, but we now have this new JSON uh, mode. Um, where we can see now lots of JSON that gets dumped here. Uh, basically, all the individual records that we are reading are now decoded um, uh, by uh, the decoders we have for those files. And we get a decoded representation of uh, those files in the export, which is nice if you basically just want to get a, a full like readable dump of the card uh, in a text file. You can redirect that. Uh, and well, yeah. It takes some time, of course, if you let it to continue all the way to the end. But um, then you have uh, basically something you can uh, grab through uh, and, and search and so on. OK, um, then we have yeah, more encoders, decoders. That's uh, difficult to show exactly which were added. And it's too detailed. The VRTLV file support has been added. So we can do select ADF ISIM, for example, select EF IMS config data. Ah, it's invalidated. <laughs> Activate file. So this is a BRTLV file, which we, oh, yeah, no, actually not on this card. This is a, a broken card. Um, so as you can see here, the structure of this file is transparent, but it should be a BRTLV uh, file. So this is a, a card um, uh, that does not support BRTLV files. I, yeah. Bad, bad preparation. I should have had a card ready. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, the, if we look at help, we will see there's the BRTLV related uh, commands. So we have delete data, retrieve data, retrieve tags, and Z data. Um, and those are the commands that we could now use if it actually was a correct card with BRTLV uh, structured files uh, in this case. So RRM support, um, uh, select um, adf.rrm. Now we're in the RRM application dedicated file. It has been selected. And if I again type help here, we see application specific commands. Um, and for example, we can do rm get all. And we get a JSON decoded representation of uh, the access rule reference data object uh, stored in this ARA applet uh, for 
um, and, and actually that part I think is the uh, yeah must be the certificate uh, hash uh, for the application um, that uh, should then get permissions on Android in this example and you can use the other commands of course to store rules to delete rules and uh, yeah all of that um, it's documented in the manual the details and yeah support for generic cards of course yes and some yeah, something that I'm working on maybe very quickly before we go into the um, global platform discussion. Um, so sometimes uh, you have a hex string that you want to decode, um, uh, which is not from a card. Um, like you have some kind of protocol trace or something, and you know this is a record of a file on the card, uh, a certain file on the card, and it would be nice to use all the decoders that we now have in PySim shell on this hex string. Um, let me just very quickly get such a hex string that is not from this card. Um, also, if, for example, you work with eSIM profiles and you have these ASN1 uh, text, uh, ASN1 value notation files for an eSIM profile, uh, they're likewise there, you may have a hex string that represents some record or some file, and you would li like to run it through the PySIM decoder. Um, just give me a second. Um, Oh. Let's say um, we want uh, something like, um, no, that's not a good idea. Um, yeah, let's take uh, the EFMZ for example. So I've copy and pasted now uh, from uh, some text file the hex string uh, that represents the IMZ uh, somewhere in on another card. And now I, what I can do is I can say select PDF usim slash EFMZ. So I go into that file and then I say hex decode decode hex. I think it is decode hex and copy and paste that string and then it runs it through the decoder as if that data was coming from the card and gives you the decoded representation of that uh, in, the, in this example. So um, yeah, that's another uh, usability improvement uh, for, for uh, this and the very early beginnings of global platform, but uh, that we will look at um, after talking about global platform. Um, how are we in terms of time? I have the feeling it's already going on way too long. Yeah. Um, Okay, global platform. So, um, global platform is what specifies the Java card universe. Um, uh, SIM cards are not required to be Java cards, of course, but in practice they mostly are. Um, and mostly only implement older global platform versions. Um, and uh, one of the interesting topics, which is my main, uh, of course, my main vector uh, for this now is how to install, remove, lock, and unlock applets on the card. Um, and in order to do so, we need uh, these transport layer security protocols, or at least one of them, um, in order to access those features of global platform. Um, Specifically, what I want to add in a PySIM shell as a most important feature is the ability to lock applets. Um, uh, how is that useful? Uh, there's uh, quite a number of users of uh, the Sysmo iSIM cards which want to deactivate the iSIM applet or even want to deactivate the USIM and the iSIM applet in a way that uh, the card behaves like a classic 2G SIM card, for example. And uh, the way how we suggest to do this so far is to remove the records from the uh, EFDIR, from the directory of applications on the card. But there's a number of phones that just don't care what is in EFDIR and select uh, the applet and basically try blind selection of the applet. And if it is there, uh, it will use it no matter whether it's in directory or not. And um, so uh, that is possible uh, through uh, locking an applet, uh, this option of uh, really uh, like we can deactivate a file or activate a file. And similarly, we can uh, lock or unlock applets, um, but uh, we need a uh, global platform to do this uh, since it's not a file system operation. So 
Global Platform has a number of APU level commands, for example, for key management, you can put and delete keys. Uh, likewise, you can store some data or remove data. Uh, or Yeah, no, rather store and get, yeah, uh, and so on. Then there's an entire litany of uh, commands for installation and deletion of executable and applets, uh, like this, all these different install versions. I'm not going to read through them. Uh, I always found that rather funny. Um, uh, I never, I mean, I, I always read this in the spec, uh, but yeah, they have so many different variants of install. I'm sure, it uh, has makes it sense. So, but what we need to do in order to use most of those commands, I think I mentioned it somewhere. No, I didn't. Um, okay, so uh, what we need to do is we need to establish a, a transport level security between our external software and the card. Uh, to, uh, to do those global platform operations, it's not sufficient to have an ADM pin, like for those um, administrative commands that uh, Etsy specifies. We just need the ADM pin uh, and a properly configured card, and we can do that, but for global platform, um, we need uh, a secure uh, communication channel, and uh, that means we need to implement the necessary transport protocol for that. And uh, the protocol uh, that is used by uh, the majority of the SIM cards I know is SCP-02, not SCP-03. That's the later. SCP-01 is already deprecated for many years. It's the older version, and I think it's Secure Channel Protocol, the uh, SCP acronym. And um, not to be confused with uh, secure copy, um, which I just realized. So what it does is it performs mutual authentication between the card and the external software uh, using a separate set of keys um, that's not related to any of the SIM card keys, not related to K, OPC, and so on. And from this mutual authentication, it generates session keys. And then um, using those session keys, you can have message authentication and or um, encryption of the data. And um, uh, you can exchange these protected APDUs uh, between on-card and off-card software. So the process looks a bit like this. So the off-card entity, which is our software, uh, in this case on the PC or on, on, on a phone, which hypothetically might use that, but I don't think there's the phones really doing global platform SCP-02 uh, to cards. Uh, that would mean that the phone itself would have the key material to, to access that. Um, so there's an initialize update command. I don't know why they have such a, such a strange name for establishing a, a secure channel. Um, and uh, it basically, the host, ho there's a host challenge uh, generated with a random factor, uh, this initialize update. Then the security domain uh, on the card itself uh, will basically uh, generate uh, session keys and a card challenge using a random uh, factor and respond with that in the initialize update response. Uh, and uh, the um, software entity here on the off card entity will uh, verify um, the cryptogram that has been received and uh, respond with the cryptogram in the external authenticate command. And once this process has successfully completed, we have session keys and mutual authentication and can uh, exchange secure um, messages between both uh, sides. So yeah, these uh, these are the commands related to SCP-02. We have initialize up to external authenticate. Uh, those two we will discuss uh, shortly later. Um, once we have the keys, there is uh, the CMAC, the command message authentication code, which um, Basically, you have the APDU in plain text that you want to send, uh, class, instruction, P1, P2, length of command, and optional data here. Um, and to this data field, you add padding, the padding um, up to uh, whatever size that your Mac uh, will generate here at the end, uh, your CMAC uh, algorithm. Um, you increase the uh, basically, you increase the, the length, the length of the command by the size of the padding here. Also, you set some secure messaging bit in the class byte in the front of the APDU. Um, uh, by the way, this uh, shows the so-called modified APDU CMAC. Uh, there's two flavors, and the card will tell you which of the flavors it supports. Uh, in my case, I'm working with cards that use the modified APDU scheme, which means you change the LC and set the secure messaging bit before you, do, you compute the MAC. 
whereas in the other scheme you first compute the MAC and then you change those bits um, afterwards. So you have the padding, then you generate the, the MAC. Uh, ICV I think is also a result of the um, of the mutual authentication, the session keys, and um, then uh, yeah you 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 copy basically the, those fields and append the MAC, and then you have your authenticated APDU that you can send to the card. Um, Likewise, there's optional response MAC that you can enable, which means that the responses from the card uh, to uh, the um, software off-card software will be uh, will have a message authentication code. And let's not look at all the details here. And then, last but not least, you can also enable data field encryption, which means that after uh, you computed the MAC, you basically remove the MAC again. Uh, then you add some padding to the data, you encrypt the data, and then you uh, append the MAC again. Um, so you, the authentication code is done only on the plain text like you want it, um, uh, and you have the encryption uh, that doesn't uh, already include the, the, the MAC uh, field. Um, Yeah, that's correct. It's it's data field. Uh, so uh, Pavlov just says that RMAC and RNC are rare with SCP02. Um, okay, uh, it's uh, um, and the 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 header bytes are like a class instruction, uh, and also I think the parameter bytes and the length even is all not encrypted. That's all plain text. That's why it's called data field encryption. Only the data field is encrypted. So. We still know what kind of instructions are being executed, uh, and of course, well, probably like what kind of parameters. Um, but the data uh, that is in the command uh, is uh, encrypted in this mechanism, if it's enabled. Yeah. So this is all the theory. So what about the practice? Um, I did some research and looking for implementations of SCP02. Um, I mean, what probably most people use is a Global Platform Pro, of course, which is a Java program that can be used and implements uh, all, like all of this and much more. Um, but of course, I would like to implement uh, some uh, support in PySim shell so we can also, uh, for example, lock applets, uh, delete applets, uh, unlock applets, all these operations. And um, uh, there's two implementations of SCP-02 in Python. Uh, one of them is, I, call, I think, is called Asterix, uh, not Asterisk, like the the PBX, but Asterix. Uh, yeah, like like the uh, like the comic uh, character. And the other one, I forgot the name. Uh, the problem is. Uh, Asterix looks rather nice and complete, uh, has API documentation, uh, seems to have a nice data model, uh, really nice, but it's Python 2. And uh, Python 2 in the kind of flavor that takes tons of manual effort to convert to Python 3. It's not just running 2 to 3. Um, and then there's the other implementation, which is a Python 3 implementation, but it's, well, um, an acquired taste in terms of the programming style because it seems to prefer using only methods without any object orientation and using only global variables in instead of uh, having arguments or functions so and, and no documentation of course so that's also uh, not really uh, a suitable um, uh, python library to use so i think in the end one will have to come up with a new library um, maybe inheriting some ideas from Asterix, um, since uh, as I said from like from a high level, it, it it looked rather nice. It's just that it's a Python two implementation, which uh, hurts these days. Of course, it was written some years ago uh, when that all made sense. Yeah, so I don't have a, a schedule or a, a plan. It's just on my wish list. And of course, there's always many projects on my wish list. But uh, I guess uh, one year from now, uh, we will have for sure have it uh, at some point. In the meantime, I guess we will have uh, some library. Yeah. Um, Last but not least, uh, one slide about over the air. And since we're already running way beyond the schedule, um, 
maybe uh, we will have a separate talk about that at some point in the future. So over the air is a mechanism how the uh, some software element in an operator core network or behind an operator core network can talk to a SIM card in the field. Um, it traverses the entire 3GPP core and radio access network, uh, hence the name over the air. So in this system overview from the relevant uh, Etsy spec actually, is that we have um, some kind of um, uh, sending application and a receiving application. Um, so one could be in an uh, UICC uh, and one could be off a site. So in, in this case, let's say the UICC is on this side. So the receiving entity is your phone and you have an application on the SIM card um, and you have a transport mechanism in between and a transport mechanism could be uh, SMS point to point or um, SMS cell broadcast or a USSD or a TCP based mechanism. So there's a variety of different transport mechanisms, how a secure tunnel can be established between something on the operator backend and the SIM card. And then uh, applications on the SIM card can exchange these OTA APDUs to perform basically anything that the card wants. But the most common operations that we have implemented on cards is the remote application management called RAM and remote file management called RFM. And using remote file management, you can update uh, files, uh, create files, um, deactivate files, all the stuff that you would do with an ADM pin in front of the card if you have it uh, on your desk. Um, and with remote application management, you can basically do what you can also do with global platform uh, in terms of like installing applets uh, and, and things like that. And with that, I finally stopped my lengthy monologue. Um, sorry for taking so long, probably a couple of too many topics were squeezed in one talk and I will shut up now. Yes, I think uh, it's good to hear an uh, in-depth treatment of this. Um, I mean, all of this global platform and uh, smart card stuff can be a bit confusing. Um, it shares the property, uh, property with um, the telephony standards. All of these standards are layered. A lot of them are kind of um, grab bags of features, like, uh, for example, ISO 7816 um, has a lot of options, like BRTLV, for example, um, that many um, smart card standards don't use at all. Um, and some of them have only found use over time, like, for example, BRTLV in, in ISIM. Um, also, these standards often have a lot of concepts that are meant only for specific use. So you kind of have to know which parts of the standards to ignore in a specific use case if you want to be somewhat pragmatic about it. Um, I've mentioned in the chat that um, my project has a, an implementation of a global platform host site in uh, Java uh, that, of course, includes um, the SCPs. Um, I have relatively complete implementations of them that have tests against some vectors and so on. Um, I currently don't have a project to drive me porting this to Python, but I, I did want to do this because it's easier to tool with, easier to you know, get to people with, quite honestly, who, who likes Java after all. Um, but I'll be glad to discuss um, options for moving on here. Um, and if anyone has questions about global platform, I, I think I, sh I should be able to answer most of them. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, let's see if somebody has questions. Um, I, there's plenty of people who like Java. I mean, maybe not you and me, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> undoubtedly there's plenty of people who like it. So, I mean, my project in my project, I do have um, very idiomatic Java implementations of all of this. None of this is really pretty, but I mean, it works um, if you you're consistent with it. Um, my reason for going Java was that um, I was um, doing things mostly around uh, development tooling. Uh, and for that, it was easier to do this in Java because it's um, the best and easiest way to integrate with all of the Java side tooling. Yeah, I mean, Java is extremely strong in the smart card context, um, undoubtedly. So it's, 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 it's an obvious choice in terms of the existing uh, universe, uh, let's say. 
One nice bit about Python, I'm not sure. I mean, Thorm probably knows, uh, but I'm not sure uh, how many others. Uh, the Python, uh, the PyS card framework has a very nice, uh, I think they call it smart card connection decorator class, um, which uh, allows you to basically have a, a, a shim layer that does the encryption and decryption. So all your higher level code that, for example, selects a file or reads a binary or does whatever, um, you can basically just uh, plug this, um, uh, you implement a derived class of this smart card decorator that implements your encryption, decryption, Mac, whatever. And then you can use the same uh, code that you had before, uh, basically on, on top of that. Yes, that sounds very nice um, because um, wrapping these, these protocols, it's all, all quite a mess internally. Um, and um, I've found it well at least, um, I mean, I had to think about it for a while uh, when I implemented this and how to do this in a secure way, kind of um, isolating the, the right aspects. The standards don't, don't really point out how to do that. You, you have to figure, figure all of that out on, on your own. 